All right. We'll catch back up with those guys later. Maybe they can just sit away for a sec. It's three after, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Oh, okay. Got to Tim. <laughs> Those pesky mute buttons. All right. Um, let's see. Where are we? Um, all right. Community time. Anything from the community that people want to bring up? I don't see anybody new, so I'm guessing no. Okay. Move forward. Um, no key updates since we didn't have a call this week. Just a slight update. Um, for KubeCon China, uh, Kathy is not going to be able to make it, so I will be presenting both sessions, um, unless somebody else happens to be there who wants to join in. But I haven't heard it from anybody, so I'm assuming that's not true. Um, and the slides are not quite yet available, but they are due June 10th, so I'm hoping to make that or do that this weekend. So then you guys can take a look at them and make sure it didn't go off the rails. Um, all right, so TOC call this week. Uh, the topic of what three independent end users meant was brought up. And the agreement I got from TOC was that it is users of the product that implements our spec. It is not just three implementations of the spec itself, um, which is kind of, I think, what a lot of us expected anyway, but it's good to have the confirmation. And I asked if they actually uh, are going to use sort of the honor system and say, yes, you know, is it going to have to say, I have customers, or do they actually need names? And they said, ideally, they want names as proof. If for some reason the names are confidential, then we can work out some mechanism to get them that information offline so it's not public. But they do want confirmation that it is three end users of products that implement the spec. So, um, oh, and the other question was, uh, somebody, I can't remember who it was, asked if there's a version requirement that we have to reach before we go to uh, incubator. And the answer was no. The documentation, or the, the governance documentation doesn't say anything about version numbers for any of the levels, including being a graduated project even though I think there's an uh, implication that you should at least be 1.0, but the government stock doesn't actually say it. But for incubator, we're okay being beta, alpha, whatever you want to call us, okay? So um, anyway, any questions on that? Uh, it, what, is, what, is, what does that mean? What does user mean? Does that play? Does that production? Is that? It says, it basically, it just says they're using it in production. Oh, okay. I'm sure we have people who are using it in production. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure we can meet that criteria. So uh, what I was going to do was wait until after we get 0 0.3 out the door and then come back around and ask the group if we want to try to go forward with being an incubator project. But I figured we should wait at least until 0 0.3 since yeah, that's that, our next milestone. Yeah, that makes sense. OK. Just, Doug, the, the, the announcement I sent about Adobe using it, this is actually a production thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I assumed it was. That's why I was hoping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, why, that's why I was so excited by your notes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I okay. mean, we, we've been shipping event ops with it, and I'm sure that people are using it. So it's just a question of, you know, who, who, who are we giving them? Exactly. Yep. All right, cool. So like I said, I think we can revisit this uh, going to incubator status after we get 0 0.3 out the door. I think it makes sense to wait. And with that, before we jump into PRs, are there any other high-level topics people would like to bring up? All right. In that case, Clemens, I believe you are up. Um, I, I was uh, I'm trying to remember what did you make any significant changes? I did not. No, this one. Um, hold on. Yeah, I guess I have one question for you. Um, this must be settable aspect. Yep. That and that to me, as I was reading, it kind of implied we were dictating what. Uh, SDKs have to do. And I was wondering whether you would consider that to be out of scope for the cloud event spec itself. Well, setable, what, I, what I mean with settable is that you should be able to, to so effectively, effectively what this type system definition that I have now implies is that there's always a conversion. Um, or, or, or there is a canonical way to express, to express a value of that type. And we have a canonical string representation for every single one of them. Mm -hmm. And, but you should use the most, um, um, the best native representation for SDKs, but also for protocol mappings. So a time, the time value should be a timestamp in MQP. So, Set, setting means means broadly how do you map from a field over here to a field over there and it's not necessarily being prescriptive about 
you know how your API should look or how your your stack should look, but effectively you should always be ready to set whatever that value is in your native stack with a string type and then be ready to do that conversion and do the check at that point. And you should always have a you should always have a way to go and convert that value that you have there in your native type system back into that canonical string. Okay, I think that helps me. So that's 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 what what I mean by that. What I'm not restricting is um, uh, in that text event um, is, and I think I have a have a comment about this. It's perfectly okay for you to go from um, you know a a Go SDK which has a timestamp to um, AMQP which has a timestamp and never use the string type at all. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that's fine. It's just that. That when you have a mismatch, when you can't map, then you should be able to go to a string from that string to the other native type. So, for instance, the, the example that I brought up in the comments was um, uh, Unix Unix epoch um, is used widely used to represent timestamps, and of course, the C sharp timestamp has an epoch that starts at different a different date. Of course, so one safe way to go between those two is to go map to RFC three 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 nine, and then map back, and then you don't have any any issues um, with with that. Right. Okay. That helps. Thank you. I just let me just check to see if there are other comments and left in the issue itself or PR. Um, I don't think so, there are any unaddressed. Okay, go ahead. So, Sorry, comments. So just just for for people who haven't who haven't read this and are on the call, the objection was that there are quotes around strings and headers, specifically in HTTP. Um, and what this what this here does is um, it does in a very wordy way does away with just simply using JSON um, as the type system that introduces a type system that has the effect of the strings being exactly the same as they would be in JSON if you if you would use a date time and, and, a, and a string uh, and, and a number etc so and actually using the I'm, I'm deep linking into the JSON number definition, and I take the integer part of that number definition for that to be a number. And the overall effect is that while all JSON rules stay intact in terms of how you formulate a message, you can literally use a JSON encoder um, to go and, and turn your strings into the right format and, and back, uh, to turn your types into the right format and back. Um, the effect of that is that I make the codes go away. That's basically it. Do you want to talk just for clarity's sake for, for people who may not have read it? Do you want to explain how we deal with extensions then? Uh, yeah, so extensions are so you would define the extensions as with their proper types, the types you expect. So you have an integer for your sequence, we have this, the, the, the sequence number thing. Um, and so, so you, you'll define extensions with the proper type. Um, how extensions are, are generally how, how attributes travel on the wire is not so important if you have a way for your type abstraction to um, turn them back into the right type. So what you would do is in your, um, I expect that if you care about an extension and if you care about the semantics of that extension, you will have an expectation about that type, which means but data arrives to you either in the right in the right type, um, you know, natively mapped from let's say a, a, a message that has a type system, like an integer maps to an integer um, from A to P into Go, um, or it arrives as a string, and then at that point you pick up a string. But since your extension expects an integer, it will go and and do then. A, a conversion from that string into an integer, and the rules that we set here that we say here this is the this is the 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 wire this is the wire uh, uh, type description. We basically mandate that that's that that string is convertible into the integer. So effectively, the conversion into the native type system of the programming language happens at the edges. But we're not caring so much about it being the right type on the wire. Right, and just for for completeness sake, um, you know, I want to explain what happens for unknown extensions at the receiving yeah. side. So, uh, for unknown, oh, so let's say you have an intermediary, and the intermediary doesn't know, right? So you the message shows up in 
is you have an intermediary, the intermediary gets an, it gets an event by HTTP and sends the event onwards using HTTP. Um, and then you have a, a receiver, and the receiver now wants to go and evaluate the extension. The way that works is um, the event comes, so you have a field that comes in and is supposed to be a date, comes in as a string over HTTP. You copy that because you don't know what that is. You copy that in as a string into the MPP message. The MP, even though it ought to be a date, but it travels as a string. You send that to the consumer. The consumer now goes and walks up to that MPP field, expects it to be a timestamp, but now finds it to be a string, and it should now be able to blindly apply the conversion rule for daytime uh, from string to daytime, and that should work because we have specified effectively um, uh, for that extension that that ought to be that that ought to be a date. Someone, the publisher has put it in there with that intent, right? And it has been converted on the way because it has been HP on the way. But even though it shows up on NGP as a string, the consumer should be able to go and convert that then. All right. Cool. Thank you. All right. And, and we're and so so just, let me one more sentence. In AQP itself, we're actually going to take that exact same mechanism and we're going to push that down into the um, into the AQP spec so that in the case of AQP, the stack is already do, going to do that conversion. So if you're going to speak to, if you're going to ask for a field to be um, a daytime, but the wire type is a string, we're going to go and do exactly the same conversion. So we're effectively using that. So I'm, 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 I'm taking that same mechanism and putting it into two places now. Okay. All right. Thank you for the summary, Clemens. Uh, any questions or comments from people on the call? Nothing at all? Okay. <clears throat> In that case, we'll ask the question. Is there any objection to adopting this pull request? All right. A little too easy there. All right, it is then approved. Thank you so much, Clemens, for your hard work on putting this one out there. Thank you for accepting this. And that's, that's a PR that I'm a little proud of, um, I have to say, because it's, uh, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a trick, but I think it will work well. Yep, I would agree. Yeah, well, good job. Good job on that. Yeah, those quotes were annoying, so thank you. <laughs> All right, so I believe, just for clarity's sake, or if we're going to uh, just for completeness. Scott, I believe you think we can close out this pull request. Is that true? That's right. Okay. And then I know, I don't think, I think this was from Alan, right? No, um, it's, um, it's Adam. Adam, sorry, Adam. Yeah, uh, but you think it's all this too. Okay, excellent. Cool. Okay. 396. So, can close. Is there anybody on the call who disagrees with being able to close that PR? And 396 as well. Oops. Jeez, I can't type. All right, not hearing any objections. Mr. Mr. got the numbers right, 396. Yep, okay. Cool. Excellent. We'll do that. All right, Clemens, size constraints. Do, 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 do. That has been a long road. Yes, it has. Uh, you want to bring us up to speed on where you are? Let me hide the comments for, uh, just for a second. Yeah, exactly. Uh, go ahead and summarize. Uh, the yeah, so the last changes that I made were um, uh, today. Um, I took uh, two. Uh, I I took two com two sets of comments. Uh, hang on, let me just go. One second. So there was Christoph and Eric made suggestions and I took um, some of those. So first of all, I called the size limits instead of size constraints. It's kind of within the, I, I find guarantees a little, a little um, um, strong, um, but constraints maybe doesn't, doesn't say that. So I call it limits because I also speak about limits. Uh, in the second uh, line here in the first paragraph. Um, and then I 
uh, Crystal found the constraint on the publisher redundant, and I agree with that. So I took that out, so that was line 447 down there. Um, so that there used to also be a rule about publishers out that I that I now uh, removed. Um, there was an um, objection from discussion from um, uh, Eric saying um, that the at least rule here for intermediaries um, were inclusive and were saying you have to go and and, and do um, forward events of every size. Um, I, I think I think if you so in terms of, of what I think this means normatively is that if you support 64K, you are compliant, you are uh, conformant. And, um, but I don't know how to express that better to say, you know, you have to go and support 64K, but I, it's okay to support more. Um, but then there is a, for, for, um, for receivers, or for consumers, that's the next line then. Um, is that the consumer should accept events of a size of at least 64K and that's a practicality because there is um, uh, some devices maybe which are interested in using cloud events which will have a problem with having those sizes. So I'm making this a little bit more lenient, but I'm effectively producers should be able to uh, publish events up to 64K safely, um, which means they will get into and through intermediaries. And then it's still up to each particular consumer whether they want to go and take those events. But the middleware will not, will not go on strike if you publish events of um, 64K. And then it's up to a consumer whether it wants to go and deal with events that happen to be larger. And that's the that's the the effect of all this. You can we can as a producer, if you send an event with 64k, the intermediaries will not stop you. If only the last mile may complain because they only have four kilobytes of memory and they can't deal with it. But that's the last mile's problem. Okay, uh, Eric, did you want to just speak up about your concerns about the wording? Well, I, I guess most simply, uh, I think we agree that um, the, the first statement there above the comments uh, in, includes uh, amounts of 64 kilobytes. Um, what I, my reading is that it also includes amounts that are greater and, and there's a must on the forwarding of those events. So I, I, it was just a, a wiggle on wording and I, I think that it's easy to correct for. And, yeah, well, the, the, uh, what you should be reading is that the meteors must forward events of the size of 64K or greater. Which is, right. which is not what this is saying. Uh, well, the, that, that was my perception of what it was saying. If I, I, I could be incorrect, I, I, but... I'll be happy to be corrected in, in my English because that's not my native tongue, but... I want to effectively. I want this. I want this sentence to be to set a lower bound. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or rather, right. Uh, my my understanding is that uh, to get the intent uh, that I think you mean uh, that you would say it should be a, of size at most sixty four kilobytes. So the requirement would be for uh, all events up to sixty four kilobytes, and then there would be an additional addition addition of uh, kind of, um, you can do what you want with anything over that. Um. If, we, if, we re, if we change the end of the sentence to be of a size of a size of 64K or less, yeah. would that clarify it? That would, that would work fine. Is that still consistent with what you wanted, Clemens? Um. Although you want to capitalize the B. Yeah, we can, we can, we can do that. It's okay. Just for you, Eric. Yes. <laughs> May I just ask a question here? Mm -hmm. uh, listen to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I really don't know uh, normally uh, what the size of the event should be. So whether really 64K, 64 kilobytes should be the maximum or minimum. Any uh, 
Can you guys give any examples? Do you know what is really happening in the actual world? Uh, forget about the virtualization, even legacy systems. What are the size of the events that we usually come across? Um, for, for what we have in Azure um, on event grid, which is all the events that are being uh, sent when you create a new blob and there's a new a VM has deployed and um, there's a queue available, etc. Most of those events are like 1K, 2K, 3K at most. I see. I see. And, and and those sizes are mostly due to very long URLs that are in them. Right. So I I thought I mean my general thinking is 64k byte is is really more than enough. But uh, I think based on what you said, maybe that's true. I just wanted to see really whether I'm thinking correctly or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, I apologize. I didn't, I didn't see who raised their hand first, but on my list, Tim, your hands up first. Tim, you have the cloud mute yet? Okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, on AWS's uh, central event bus, our limit is 256k currently, and and we do have customers who run into it. Um, one flavor of events is API calls, and some API calls can take immense lists of, of arguments to describe and so on. Um, no matter what number you, you pick, it will be an irritant for some people. We may, we may like to think that events should be small, but sometimes they're just not, so. Okay, so just, just to point out though, nothing in here I think prevents anybody from sending very large messages. This is just trying to guarantee some, some have some base level of interop, I believe is the intent, right, right uh, Clemens? Yeah, and I think so. Christoph came up with this, and I think that the goal was to make to have a baseline of um, of what would be supported by everybody, um, and that was the intent of it. Like an event, an event can be ten megabytes if all the infrastructure supports it. Right. Okay. Um, Christoph, I'm going to pick on you, even though your hand went down. Is there something you want to say? <laughs> I uh, posted a link in the chat where that's the original issue that has like a couple of different protocols or products and their size limits. Oh, so cool. it's a bit all over the place, but in, I think for 64K is basically the lowest. Uh, so we're safe on that. We don't exclude any technology. And that's the kind of the point where I don't, why I would feel size guarantee would be a better name because it more tells us that this 64K is not a lower limit, but it's just the lowest guarantee that we can give. You can still go above it, but there's no guarantee for you. But that's just me. Okay. Uh, Tim, your hand is still up. Did you want to say anything else? Oh, okay, cool, thank you. Okay, Mehmet, does that answer your, your questions? I think so. What I was basically trying to get to see do we really need to set up a maximum limit over it? But I see you guys are saying that, you know, if somebody wants to have a larger uh, event size, they can still do that. And, and also the practical numbers are much lower than 64 kilobytes. So I'm, I'm really okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, then circling back around to Eric's original question or concern, are people okay with this slight wording change? of this sentence of line 447 to end it with of a size of 64 kilobytes or less, just to, for clarity's sake. Thank you, Christoph. Any, anybody else want to speak up? Uh, Clemens, I assume you're, you said you're okay with that, right? I ha already have it staged. I just need to go push it. Okay. Okay. Anybody else on this particular wording change here? Any comments? All right, not hearing any concerns. In that case, what about the PR in general? Let me hide all comments for a sec. What about the PR in general? Any questions or concerns? Okay, let me ask the question then. Is there any objection to adopting this pull request with the suggested wording change that we have down here? Only once. All right, cool. Thank you guys very much. Another tough one behind us. I thank you guys very much for your patience on that. And, All right. and I'm pushing it already. So. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, let me make a comment there. Approved. 
with wording change. Cool. All right, next one on the list. This one was mine. This is just a reminder. This is just for the primer, so it's completely non-normative. Um, but it basically gives some guidance around how you should be producing cloud events. Um, in particular, it focuses a lot on uh, producers that are not part of the event source directly. Um, so they're acting on behalf of the event source and you know, how they should populate those fields and, and stuff like that. I think it also does touch a little bit on intermediaries on what they should or should not do as the message goes through them. Um, and at a high level, I, I believe I basically say, for the most part, intermediaries really should not touch the message. Um, it, it, much like HTTP proxies, it, it, it's okay for them to add additional properties, um, but generally they don't touch things unless there's a very good reason for them to, to, to touch a certain property. Because um, generally these are things that are supposed to be passed through just because the, end re the receiver of the message, uh, or the receiver of the event in this case, really shouldn't know or care that it's going through an intermediary for the most part. Um, that's why you know, they may add extra stuff just to let people know that there was a, a, a proxy in there someplace, but that doesn't materially change the, the semantics of the message. Anyway, it's been out there for a couple of weeks now. Um, no new comments. Any questions on this? Okay, going once. Okay, any objection to approving it then? Okay, cool. You guys are awfully quiet today. Okay. Um, wow, that's the end of the agenda in terms of, of <laughs> issues that are ready. Um, let me think if there's anything in here we could talk about. Oh, okay, so here's one. Actually, let me ask, is there, is there a topic anybody else would like to bring up? Otherwise, I'm going to go to this Kafka one. Okay, so... Um, not, I'm not going to actually talk a whole lot about this other than just to make sure you guys are aware that based upon the, uh, what was it called, the partition key PR that went in, like I think a couple weeks ago, that unblocked the Kafka PR because the authors of this PR thought that was a blocking thing for them. So they've, uh, I think it was Neil made a whole bunch of edits uh, to bring it up to speed and rebased and, and, and to take into account that new property. Um, but anyway, he went through, made a whole bunch of edits. It's out there for you guys to review it. Um, I don't think it's necessarily wise for us to necessarily walk through it here on the call, but if, if, does anybody on the call have any comments or questions about this, if they have had a chance to review it yet? Okay. Um, what I'd like to do then is ask for everybody to look this over uh, during the next week or so, and hopefully um, we might be able to get this one approved next week, assuming there aren't any major concerns with it. Um, God, this one's been out there for a very long time. So I know the guys um, who authored this would be very happy to get this one in there since it's so old. All right. In that case, I'm trying to think of anything else worthy of discussion here. Uh, let me pick on Klaus for a sec. Are you still there? Yeah, Klaus, you're still there. Is this issue something that you're still working on? Um, <laughs> well, there was this other PR. Um we merged a few weeks ago that was uh, meant as a preparation for it. So mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, I was busy, busy with uh, KubeCon preparations and everything. Now I could uh, start thinking about this one again. Okay, cool, thank you. I just wanna make sure we can, I wasn't supposed to close it. Okay. Okay, in that case, I guess the only other thing we, we could possibly discuss today is 0 0.3. Um, what's interesting is I, I looked at the governance doc and I don't believe we technically require a week for uh, approval of, of the spec. However, votes in general do require a week. And I feel like um, approving of a version of the spec is kind of a big deal. And so I don't want to necessarily feel like anybody uh, felt like we rushed things past them. So what I'd like to do is this, is <clears throat> once we go through the process of actually merging these approved PRs into master, what I'd like to do is send out a note officially kicking off the one view, whether you want to call it a review cycle or formal vote. Um, it's up to you guys. Um, but what I'd like to do is give people a week to look it over. And assuming no one finds anything 
too egregious in the spec that can't be fixed later on through wordsmithing. Um, I'd like to do a, a close of the vote down um, next week's call and get the 0 0.3 out the door on, uh, at the beginning of next week's call. Does that sound okay to everybody? It sounds okay, Doug, but I have a question. This is Roberto. I, I'm, I'm kind of struggling a little bit to understand how I'm supposed or everybody's supposed to keep up with the, with the spec version changes. So when we did the GDPR events for using cloud events, we use 0.2 because that was the one that's there. But as the spec evolves over the next months, I'm not exactly sure what we're supposed to do to keep up. Should we just, I mean, our format will still be compliant with 0.3, but should we actually modify our event to actually say 0.3 at this point? And then when it becomes 0.4 and 0.5 and 1, obviously when 1 ships, we should definitely move to 1. But I wonder if we need to do anything at this point or is it okay to just keep emitting 0.2? I'm, I'm a little lost. Yeah, so I'll, I'll let... I have an opinion, but I'd like to pick on someone else first who I know has this in production as well to see what they do. Clement, in particular, since you guys were the first out there, let me pick on you. What's been your guys' strategy relative to the version numbering scheme? Um, okay. I mean, and I've been paying sufficient attention. <laughs> Did you bump your version numbers in your implementation of cloud events as we as we change the version number in the spec? Uh, in the SDK, yes. In the product, we have uh, waited out um, zero two because um, the product schedule didn't align, um, and we're going to pick up zero three um, in the coming quarter. So we're basically on zero one. Okay, but it sounds like okay. you, you'd like to upgrade as the spec changes. Yeah, yeah. we're we're gonna we're gonna upgrade as soon as this uh, locks, and then in the coming quarter we're gonna do an update. We have the way how this works in our product is we have a, a schema mapper effectively that goes from one schema to the next. So this is just for us an update to the schema mapper. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Christoph, your hands up. Yeah. What I'll do is that customers basically register there don't only say I want cloud events, but I have to specify which version of cloud events they want. So right now I support 0 0.1, uh, yeah. And then I think once, uh, because we also integrate with EventGrid, I'll wait until EventGrid also supports 0 0.3 and then people can basically choose uh, which version they want to get for some time. And then after some time, we will remove the old versions when all people have migrated off of the old version. And I yeah, let me just add add one thing um, because now I'm, I'm I'm a little bit more att paying attention. So what we what we did effective you, as you subscribe into a topic, you can choose what cloud events version you want to deliver, and that's the thing we're going to change. So effectively, when you walk up to the event grid and you subscribe, you can say, "I want to have the native event event grid format. I want to have cloud events uh, zero one." Um, or you will then be able to wish for 0 03 or 10, and then we're going to map the event appropriately. So it's a subscribe gesture thing where you can go and wish the version that you want to get. And, you, and I assume everybody would default to the latest version if they did not specify it, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so currently, by default, we still um, use our native format since we're not locked here. But we eventually want to go, want to get to a, a place where we go and offer then Cloud Events 1.0 as a native format. Uh, Roberto, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I know. But I mean, like everybody says, it requires a product change to actually make it. I mean, unless you make it a choice at the event emitter level to see which version of the schema you want to comply with. Uh, it, on, in our case, it would be like a product change to make the, the changes in the spec level. So I need to figure out how that we're going to do this. At, at some point, what we're planning to do in, at Adobe is to uh, offer all our events uh, at the subscriber level. They can choose whether they want to get it in the, in the native format or the, or, the, or the cloud events format. So uh, we, I'm, st I'm still struggling how we're going to implement this. <laughs> yeah, that, that's always one of the risks that people run when you support a spec before it reaches 1.0. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to hear guidance from what the rest of the team is doing. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, I, I, let, me, let me pick on somebody else here. Tim, um, you actually opened up an issue in the serverless repo as opposed to the cloud events repo, even though, but it is a cloud event issue. You actually asked a very similar question about, AWS's possible support for this and whether you guys should wait or, or something like that. Did you want to sort of 
summarize your, your concerns? Because I think yeah, it really I, I just realized a couple of days ago that I put it in the wrong place. Sorry about that. Would it be a good idea if I migrated it over to, to, to one of our issues? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Since, there, since there is no, since there aren't any real comments on there yet, I think moving it over at this point would be good. Okay, so give me an option to do that. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, I'm actually some of the things people just said uh, perhaps uh, changed my thinking because I've been, you know, we, we would like to support cloud events. We're going to be announcing a bunch of event related stuff later on this year and, and it would be really great if we could also say, and we support cloud events. Um, but as an old standards geek, I get cold chills at the prospect of promising to support something that isn't finished yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, I honestly, I'm not 100% sure what the best thing that AWS could do is. Now, I guess one thing we could do is just stay with our native event format that we have and say, oh, and we'll also give you uh, cloud events if you specify what version you want. Um, I'll be honest, I don't like that. Um, the reason I, I don't is that um, we have like huge numbers of people processing millions of events and they've all, every one of them has the damn field names hardwired into their code. Um, and, and they really don't want to think about version numbers and different version numbers. And, and I don't really want to think about, you know, maintaining support for an arbitrary number of old version numbers going forward. So, um, I guess the most important thing I, I, I would like to say is what's the path to, for, for, for cloud events to be finished? I, uh, maybe this is something that everybody else knows and I just missed it, but at what point can we, does it become safe for people to start hard, hardwiring attribute names into their code? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And it, um, I I know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I would want it to be now. <laughs> yes, oh, I, and a different way to ask the question is when do we call it 1.0 actually? <laughs> right, and I, so let me, let's go back over here for a sec. This is a great topic since we have 20 minutes to discuss it. Obviously, it, if we go through all the issues and we don't think any of them are worthy for 1.0, that's one criteria, right? Um, but let's see. So technically, I believe we would have reached, we would have done all our 0.3 because that's what we're going to be voting on. If you look at what we have for 0.4, we have additional serializations and protocols. I don't believe that's going to change the core spec itself, which means that these things can technically happen after 1.0 in my opinion. Process issues, again, doesn't change the core spec. So in my mind, I guess 0.5. Um, okay. Clarification, not semantic issues. So let me go back over here for a sec. We have issues like uh, Thomas had one or non goals for routing. I, I think I'd have to go back and double check, but I'm pretty sure there's at least one or two issues out there that might fall into the category of, uh, of, uh, of clarifications or things that run into like the PR we just closed today about size limits, right? actual usage of the spec itself and whether we need to make some changes based upon the real world usage. Um, I think we have some issues around that. So if we can get those behind us, in my opinion, I don't think there's any reason why we can't jump to 1.0 very, very quickly. But obviously it's up to you guys and whether you think some of the used real world experience people have like in Knative or Adobe and Microsoft, whether that's sufficient experience under our belt to say, yes, we're ready to consider 1.0. And the other thing to keep in mind is, we did agree that at some point, when we reach uh, the equivalent of 0 0.9, that we were gonna let the, the spec bake for a little bit of time to allow people the time to get some real world experience before we tag it officially 1.0. Now it's possible that Knative's usage and the other guy's usage is, 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 you know, counts as that. It's up to you guys to decide that or not. So the net of this is, my opinion is 0 0.3 is really more like a 0 0.9. And we just need to decide whether we've crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's. But what, are the, what does anybody else think? I agree. Okay. So yeah, good. that sounds good. So can you, do you have in, in, your, in your mind, Doug, any time, type of timeline in your head about when this thing could actually happen? <sighs> I don't want to just make up a number without actually looking at the issue backlog first. So let me do this. Let me take the action item. And I actually, I'd like everybody to do this as well just to make sure my analysis is, is not incorrect. I'm going to go back and look at all the open issues and pull requests and make sure, or, or pull out the ones that I think we have to resolve before 1.0. And I think once we have that list, then on next week's call, we should be able to look at that and say, okay, with, given this list, let's shoot for a target date of, you know, X number of weeks, 
and, and see if we can push for that for 1.0. And maybe it's a small number, maybe it's a large number, but I, I don't want to pull a number out of thin air without having done the analysis of what's currently known out there in terms of issues. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Does that sound fair to everybody? To have a discussion next week about requirements for 1.0? Yep, let's do that. Okay. Um, Okay, cool. Thank you guys. Maybe on the collecting feedback phase, what some other product do is they call it a release candidate and then they right, they have a time period where people test it out. And then if there's no big issue, that kind of gets adopted. Yep. So maybe that's a process we could think about as well. Yep. Yep, I like that idea. Okay. Uh, anything else on that particular topic around versioning and stuff like that? Okay. Any other topics at all people would like to bring up? All right, cool. In that case, I believe we are done. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, the usual bureaucracy. Uh, Varun, are you there? Varun? I think. Hey, sorry, I was struggling to get off mute. Not a problem. Yeah. Uh, Mehmet, I heard Ken Owens, are you there? Ken? Ken? Okay, I'm what struggling, I'm struggling with the unmute. Oh, there we go. Hey, Ken, been a while. Glad to hey. hear you. Uh, and Vladimir, are you there? Hi, Dan, I'm here. Yep, and I'm, I, I'm going to butcher the name, but Anacolio? Uh, sorry, it's Alex Nicolau, and yes, ah. I'm here. <laughs> I would not have guessed that. Okay. Is this your first time here? I can't remember. I apologize. It, it is my first time being able to join. Uh, it's been an interesting discussion. Thanks. Yeah. But do me a favor, if you're okay with it. Um, here's a link in the chat to this doc that I'm looking at. Can you just fix up your name and put your company affiliation if you want to be affiliated with a company just for the He's attendance tracker? Google. Sure. I'm from Google. Oh, I don't have that info. Well, then never mind then. Just give me your last name and you get a chance. No problem. All right. Cool. Uh, anybody else have I missed for attendance? Yeah, I'm here, Erica. Oh, Erica, cool, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep, anybody else? All right, cool. In that case, thank you guys very much. Very productive call. And we'll talk, yeah, again, we'll next talk again next week. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye. Thanks, Doug. Yep, thank you, guys.